there were many interesting sessions on security. So I'm going to try to not repeat many of those topics, although you may see some of those on the slides. There are a couple of sections that are more tactical in terms of uh, how do we do attacks on IoT systems? How do you do attacks on uh, Bluetooth, BLE protocols, and the way they work between wearables and uh, mobile platforms, right? So we'll focus more on that. Uh, if you have any more any questions on those, I'm happy to answer them during the slides or towards the end. Uh, it's a really quick introduction. My name is Sumant. I am the founder and CEO of a security consulting company called Deep Armor. Uh, we do security consulting in the sense of uh, all stages of security development lifecycle, penetration testing, threat modeling, code reviews, pen test, uh, uh, fuzzing, and so on. Uh, we also do training for uh, predominantly cloud, mobile, and IoT topics. And prior to this, I worked for Intel, for Palm, HP, and some microsystems in a variety of security roles. All right, so um, the introduction slides are going to be a repeat. Uh, broadly, Internet of Things means everything. It's, it's just things. It could be consumer goods, industrial equipment, traffic lights, construction equipment, healthcare devices, and so on. There are two main building blocks that we need to pay attention to. Right? So these are all the components that make the IoT platform, that make the IoT devices. But really, IoT is all about data. So data is the blood of IoT devices. So the question is, how do you manage the data? How do you protect the data? How do you ensure that the integrity of the data is, is, uh, is managed well? And uh, like Mr. Gandhi said, uh, how do you also ensure that the availability is OK, like the thermostat example that you gave? And of course, like uh, how things are interconnected. So that's where you see the complexities. That's where you see the problems from a security point of view and from a functional point of view. Right? So let's not discount the functional aspects of IoT. So broadly, if you look at an IoT system from, a, from an engineer's perspective, there are, there are four parts to it. On the bottom left-hand side, you see the form factor devices. So that's the ga gateways and the nodes, the edge. So these are uh, small devices uh, varying in size from like something that can be as big as a my button to uh, an edge device that is running on a, on a solid core uh, x86 processor. Uh, depending on the functionality, they might just be collecting sensor data, sensor values. Um, and the gateways will have a much richer stack in the sense that they will be sending all the collected information back to the cloud. Of course, the architectures may vary in depending on the use cases, depending on the hardware. In some cases, you'll see the mobile phones acting as a conduit, as a channel. Right? So for example, if you have a fitness tracker, usually when you take it out of the box, you first install an app on Android or iOS, you create an account, and then you start pairing your uh, fitness device, and then you start pushing all the data to the backend infrastructure. And on the cloud side of things, typically you will have this uh, AWS, GCP, Azure, or any kind of private cloud. So it really depends. It could just be an implementation like a backend web services hosting, hosted on like a server that is sitting in your office. Um, the cloud is a much richer stack, so that's where all the data gets crunched, gets managed gets presented in a way that is useful to the customers, to the businesses, and so on. So, um, so that's the third component. So now we have the, the devices, the mobile, which may or may not exist in some form factors, the cloud, and the fourth component is all the networking aspects of it. Right? So if you look at the left-hand side, you see that there are a, a multitude of protocols. There is ZigBee, Z-Wave, RF, 4G, CAT M1. So all these uh, protocols that come into play when it comes to uh, these uh, IoT platforms. So uh, I know the lady there asked about the uh, standards and how do we know what standards are good, what standards are not. But if you just Google for the standards that exist for low power communication, LoRa, WPAN, whatever, what have you. Um, as of this morning, there were more than 60 plus, as per one of the links, um, I, don't have, I think I may have the slide later on, but there are so many options that manifest in different ways. It could be like a same base standard that could be manifesting as Zigbee, that could be manifesting as Z-Wave. So it's the same IEEE standard at the core of it. Right? So, but you have different industries, different manufacturers trying to choose their own protocols or to trying to like make, a, make a new one sometimes. Because we also see proprietary RF protocols being used by many of the IoT manufacturers in India. So the question comes, are too many standards too much? Well, actually, are too many standards uh, an indication that there are no standards that are good enough for a security perspective? So expanding on that, um, so as a company, we work with a lot of vendors. And uh, some of the vendors, especially in the IoT space, when we talk to them about security, they, they come to us asking, um, can you help us understand the security of uh, such and such a, uh, an architecture, such and such a product? 
But then when we talk more about like how you need to bake security into the product, like, uh, like we said about secure by design, that's when all these questions come up, right? And, and it's justified in a way because one of the problems with IoT, in, in, particularly in this market, is that it's broadly done by small and medium-sized businesses. And more often than not, uh, pushing a product out to the market, to the shelves, means uh, whether they'll exist or not next year. Right? And, uh, and like we also discussed, there are many open source solutions and libraries for these, uh, for these platforms. So many of our clients say that I'm just paying such and such a supplier to write the code for me. It's their problem. It's not mine. But that's not true. Right? So like the gentleman from Intel said, if he buys an Apple phone, he holds Apple responsible if there's a security bug, not open SSL library. Right? And uh, many of the, uh, the vendors also talk about what kind of information they store. They say that we don't store any confidential information, therefore we don't need security. But security is not just about confidentiality. Security is also about integrity. It's also about availability. And, um, and, uh, and then they also think of uh, security as an afterthought. Again, this is the opposite of secure by design. They say that let's ship this out first. Let's worry about security if we get hacked. Right? In a later slide, we'll talk about the cost of a security bug. And the last one is my favorite. They always say that we are 100% secure. Right? So they say that uh, we have done all the, the good practices. We know what OWASP is. We know what NIST is. Uh, we bought NESSIS. We did that. We did this. So we are secure. We don't need a, a, a thorough security development life cycle. Uh, first of all, nobody is 100% secure. Even the Apples are not. Apples and Googles are not 100% secure as we see very regularly, um, but it's a perception. It's the optics also sometimes. And uh, nobody is 100% secure because uh, there are attacks on IoT happening uh, very actively. And uh, we just saw the video on the Jeep hack, and uh, the Jeep hack news is also being superseded by the Tesla hack. So Tesla is another uh, car platform that is really popular. It has a lot of computing elements in it. And uh, to the extent that if you want to raise the suspension, all they need to do is issue an over-the-air update. And the, the suspension of the car can go up depending on your speed. That's, that's actually what they did when one of their cars got into an accident. Um, and things are being hacked in the healthcare section. Things are being hacked. Mirai, a lot of chatter today about Mirai. And bottom left-hand side, you see that there was a hack on a smart rifle. You would question, why do you want to make a rifle an IoT device? Right? But they actually do it. So uh, putting any kind of code, any kind of software on any platform can actually make it vulnerable to attacks. A lot of interesting um, attacks on drones as well. So um, Icarus, this is a very interesting video that you guys can see on YouTube. So where they um, uh, looked at the DSMX protocol and uh, how that can be hacked to take control over a drone remotely without actually physically being close to it. So um, why care about security, right? So okay, fine, we'll get hacked. There are news, about art news articles about hacking and so on. But there can actually be negative consequences. Um, the, the Jeep hack uh, video was uh, very indicative of what would happen if someone took control of your car, right? At the same time, data loss can be uh, uh, very lasting in terms of its impact. There could be uh, problems with physical safety, uh, an online reputation. Though. So um, Ashley Madison uh, was uh, a questionable service that existed, that does still exists today. Um, that uh, was offering services to its users and that got hacked. And uh, uh, because there were millions of personal user information in those databases which got hacked, um, the impact was, was really severe. And uh, this is a particularly interesting case that I want to talk about because um, in this particular incident, there were email addresses, information, uh, I mean, like names, phone numbers, physical addresses of people who were actually not using that service. And that is because uh, Ashley Madison never cared to verify the email addresses of the people who were signing in on that portal. And because of this, uh, people were inadvertently exposed, even though they were not actually part of this, uh, uh, this uh, use case. And people committed suicide. Right? So all this because of a hack. 